Welcome to 1000 Days Sober. My name is Lee Davey. I'm not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol. I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people do the same, like right now. So what did I want to talk to you about? Yes, this is what I wanted to talk to you about. So 1000 Days Sober, what is it about? So 1000 Days Sober is who we are, right? It's our brand. It started out with a mission to get people and guide people to be 1,000 days sober, okay? But as we've traversed this rocky terrain, as we've helped guide people up and set these guideposts up for people so they don't fall over, or when they do, we pick them up and dust them back off again, we realize that actually alcohol is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the problems that everybody have, right? So we drink alcohol because we got so many other problems. We smoke cigarettes because we got so many other problems. We take heroin because we've got so many other problems. We bury ourselves in our work because we've got so many different problems, right? So to fix all that and to really help people come through uh, a variety of different so-called maladies, right? We created the STRIVE method, all right? And we have the STRIVE method for self-discovery. We have the STRIVE method for addictions. And we have the STRIVE method for relationships. Very similar in the way that we deal with our three-step framework, which is truth, awareness, and freedom, okay? Or as we would say, pre-recovery, recovery, and post-recovery when it comes to the world of addictions, okay? And within those three phases, we have six steps. Strive, S-T-R-I-V-E. Stuck, thought, ready, initiative, vigilance, and evolution, okay? And those are the steps that we go through to help you create incredible change incredible change and to live a kick-ass life, okay? So what I'm going to do over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to share some of my philosophy with you in these different stages. And I'm going to start out by sharing my philosophy or some of my philosophy that we teach people when they go through the stuck phase. And I'm going to talk about Harry the Hummingbird, okay? So I'm going to read a little bit off here. So you might see my eyes wander from the screen because I wrote a blog post and I'm effectively going to read that out for you. Okay. So have you ever stepped into your power, an effervescent glow illuminating the vault-like darkness of your world, a pointed finger leading to a sign that says this way. And then at that precise moment, your most auspicious and petrified moment, someone you love very much chases you across the rooftops of your new being desperately trying to push you off. Well, you won't be alone because that happened to me. One of the aftershocks of being someone that doesn't drink alcohol saw me quit a 19-year railway career to create 1,000 Days Sober, okay? And back then, I was spreading my message through writing. I was writing a blog post. And my best friend at the time, when I told him I was going to leave my 20-year career on the railway to be a writer, he said to me, you're fucking nuts. He said, I've read your stuff and it's not even that good. It's shit. Now think about that. My best friend, I'm just about to make the most monumental decision of my life. Just after making the mo most monumental decision of my life. So I quit drinking alcohol, by which, you know, he told me I was crazy to do that. And then I decided I'm going to quit the railway and travel around, be a writer. And I've never written anything before. And he says, I'm not crazy. And the way he deals with it is by telling me my shit is shit, basically. Now I'll tell you that I really remember that moment. It's, it's an emotional memory seared into my brain and it will be there forever. Such was the impact of that discussion because I couldn't believe my best friend, the person I desperately needed for support in that moment, let me down. And the glitter ball inside my heart stopped spinning. I put the phone down, and today our relationship has never been the same since, okay? We're still in a relationship because we're related, but it's not been the same since, all right? So what happened? Why did my best friend Phil su su support me in this time of need? Why did he hurt me so much? Well, we're going to ask the charm, okay? Now, there are seven species of hummingbirds in California. And one of them is called the black-chinned hummingbird. And it arrives in California in April and it migrates to Mexico in September. Now, the black-chinned hummingbird, as beautiful as it is, and we see them in my garden here, it doesn't understand why it follows its migratory path. It doesn't question it, okay? 
When the time comes, it instinct it instinctually follows the charm because that's what black chin hummingbirds do. And a charm is the name for the group of hummingbirds, right? So I want to talk a little bit about this. And I want to talk about the gene-based learning system. So hummingbirds have evolved over God knows how long through the process of natural selection, okay? So those hummingbirds that have the genetic predisposition to follow the correct and the safest and the most effective migratory path, they survive and they prosper. And those that don't die until eventually you just get this charm of hummingbirds and they're born and they just very effectively know how to get to Mexico unless you put something in the way to impede them. It's in their genes, okay? This is a gene-based learning system and it's the animalistic nature that's in all animals, including ourself, because we forget that we're an animal, but we are an animal, right? So the gene-based learning system is within us. We have an instinctual way of being as a human and all animals have the same instincts. It's called the gene-based learning system. But the reason humans differ from animals and the reason they're at the top of the food chain is we have also developed the capacity to reminisce, to process sensory information in the moment and be mindful of the presence and kind of go, oh, yeah, oh, here's a microphone, here's a, a, a light. And we also plump ourselves into the future. We're able to think about the future. We're able to go, if I don't say this in the right way, then my audience are going to think I'm a bit of a dickbag, right? A hyena doesn't think that. A hyena doesn't think, or a hummingbird doesn't think, a hyena. A hyena doesn't think, if I don't catch that rabbit, do hyenas eat rabbit? If I don't catch that zebra, the rest of the pack is going to think I'm an idiot. Hyenas don't think like that. Hummingbirds don't think like that either, okay? So, Human beings have developed conscious thought, something that a hummingbird doesn't have, okay? And this process of conscious thought allows us to explore and deepen our understanding-based management system versus the instinctive management-based system. So the nerve-based system is all about exploration, it's all about trial and error, it's all about risk, and it's all about learning from our mistakes, about failing, falling, and getting up and doing it again. It's about understanding and deciphering what is going on so we can make the right decisions going forward. But a hummingbird doesn't have that shit. A hummingbird just has instincts. It wakes up, it goes to sleep, it eats, it has sex, it tries to get eaten, and it migrates to Mexico every September. Bing, 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 okay? Now, I want to talk a little bit about resistance, a little bit, because I'm going to use it and I want you to have the context. So resistance is the voice in your head that prevents you from achieving greatness. It prevents you from taking action when you're on the cusp of absolute magnificence. It's that voice in the head that says, no, you can't do this. No, you're not worthy. No, you're not good enough. No, you're ugly enough. Who do you think you are? All those type of things. And I want to share a quote from Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art, okay, who first alluded me, alluded me? guided me towards this understanding of resistance. We fear discovering that we are more than we think we are, more than our parents, children, teachers think we are. We fear that we actually possess the talent that our still small voice tells us, that we actually have the guts, the perseverance, the capacity. We fear that we truly can steer our ship, plant our flag, reach our promised land. And we fear this because if it's true, then we become estranged from all we know. We pass through a membrane. We become monsters and monstrous. Now, Stephen Pressfield. And get that book, The War of Art. Resistance is addiction. Resistance is procrastination. Resistance is ego. Resistance is fear. All right? So I want you to just be aware of that as I proceed. So we're going to talk about this particular charm of hummingbirds. I'm going to talk about one hummingbird in particular called Harry. So imagine there's a charm of hummingbirds that are migrating from California, Mexico, and it's September, okay? Only this year, one of them feels a little bit different. And that's because, unbeknown to him, we actually took Harry from his nest, and we did some brain surgery on him. And we gave him a fully functional, fully conscious brain, all right? So we've added the nerve-based learning system to his gene-based learning system, Okay. So on cue, the charm takes to the air and they're 100 miles into the journey when all of a sudden Harry starts to feel hungry. 
And he looks down and he spots a garden full of flowers. And Harry thinks, wow, I bet there's a lot of nectar down there. I'm just going to go down and have some to eat. So as he goes to change course to go down and have some to eat, to eat, the rest of the charms stop him. I don't know how hummingbirds would stop hummingbirds, but they do. They stop him. And they say to him, whoa, what are you doing? He says, I'm feeling hungry. And they look at him perplexed. They're like, oh, no, we, we might feel hungry, but our, our job is just to go to Mexico. And he's thinking, no, well, well, I'm really hungry. No, 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 come on, we're going to Mexico. Because the gene-based learning of the charm, which has taken place since they were born, is it's fixed. It doesn't include, let's nip off and have some food. It doesn't include, let's go and explore. It doesn't include, I need a rest. It doesn't include, let's stop and have sex. It doesn't include, let's go to Hummingburg Disco, right? It doesn't include, let's try a different way, see if we can get there quicker. It doesn't include any of those things. So Harry returns to the charm because the pressure from the charm is such that he doesn't want to be alone, doesn't want to be different. But something's happened. The thought doesn't leave his mind. And as the charm continues on its way to Mexico, this thought of, I want to try something different, I want to be different. I want to go down and get some food becomes louder and louder and louder. And the hunger hunger pangs join the deafening crescendo of his group because he's now thinking, why don't they want me to do what I want to do? Why am I thinking differently to them? And then suddenly he sees another garden full of flowers and he's got all this noise in his head and he says, fuck it, I'm going to go this time. And he tries to fly down again, but they stop him again. Now, confusion sets in, then guilt, and then something really new happens that has never happened in Harry's life. A voice perks up in his head, and it calls him stupid, says he's different and abnormal because he wants to leave the charm. And then another voice comes up and says, fuck the charm. Go and do your thing. Go and explore the new garden. And before you know it, there's a war in Harry the Hummingbird's mind between this gene-based instinctive system that just wants him to go to Mexico and not ask any questions, just follow the rest of the charm and don't ask questions and do as you're told like everybody else. And then there's this nerve-based learning system that's saying, no, 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 Harry, we need to figure things out. We need to be individual. We need to be creative. We need to kind of like go with our gut, okay? Now, this is driving Harry a little bit crazy. And his problems aren't confined to his gray matter. Like, it's not just an internal battle. Because every time Harry veers off course to satisfy his inner need, right, he grows more distant to his charm. Because he doesn't like the fact that it's stopping him from his own autonomy. All animals and human beings want to be autonomous, right? He, that's not true. Not all animals want to be autonomous. But if you stick a brain, a fully conscious brain in an animal, it's going to want to be autonomous, right? So Harry wants to go and do his own thing. The charm don't want him to do, so he's not happy with that. And eventually, the charm grows really, really, really annoyed at Harry to the point they're like, we don't want this guy in our charm anymore. So they start pecking at him when he tries to rejoin the group. They're like, Harry, fuck off. So eventually, Harry ends up alone, confused, and riddled with anxiety. Okay? So back to my best friend. When I became someone that doesn't drink alcohol, my nerve-based lunar system awoke from its slumber. So I was like, basically being ran by my gene-based lunar system, or what I would call socialization, right? So I was in a rut. So the, the, the hummingbirds have their migratory path. I had my migratory path. Wake up in the morning, uh, kiss my boy, kiss my wife, get in a car, go to work, do certain things that I have to do in work, come home stressed as fuck, stop off at the pub on the way, have three pints of lager, go and get three bottles of wine for a tenner, come on, kiss my son, kiss my wife, make myself dinner, sit down in front of the telly and drink myself into a stupor, take my son to bed, wake up and do it all again, right? And then on a weekend, I would just get smashed. Smash, 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 smashed, right? That, for me, was my gene-based learning system, my kind of like instinctual path that I just didn't question at all. And then all of a sudden, when I become someone that doesn't drink alcohol, I am now awakening my nerve-based lunar system. Oh, I can make a different decision. I can do this. I can do that. I can try this. I can try that. I don't have to do this. All these thoughts come into my head and a war starts. So the decision to leave my job and explore other alternatives was one of a broad range of compulsions brought on by my new way of being. Okay? So the gene-based system is all about doing. The nerve-based system is all about being, exploration. So I wanted to discover and experience new things, okay? 
and I was afraid. But being someone that doesn't drink alcohol gave me the courage and conviction to feel the fear and do it anyway. Now, my charm, including my best friend, they were also afraid when I started to behave this way, okay? Because something in me and my change acted as a mirror to them. And their cognitive dissonance around drinking alcohol, about uh, staying stuck on a path of least resistance, about just living a mundane life, right? That started to raise his head and questions started to emerge in their minds. So they're like, I don't want this shit. I don't want resistance in my mind. So they act as swiftly as they can to shut it out by ignoring me, by ridiculing me, and eventually by ostracizing me. Although the ostracization part was a large part of my doing as well, because like when Harry is getting disowned by the charm, there's a part of Harry that doesn't want to be a part of the charm because who wants to be a part of a tribe that doesn't want you? So there's a part of that as well that I just wanted to leave these people because I knew they couldn't accept me as well as them wanting to kick me out because they couldn't accept me anymore, right? So lost and lonely, I reached out my finger again and pointed to that sign this way. Um, something familiar amongst all of this unfamiliarity, you know? And at first I felt isolated and lonely. I felt really lonely on the path to this way, this different path away from my charm. But then I saw someone else on that path. And then I saw someone else on that path. And then I saw someone else on that path until eventually there was a load of us and I had a new charm, okay? So what I want you to know is like creating an effective change in your life can change, can feel absolutely liberating, exciting, and incredible, but it can also feel incredibly terrifying, lonely, and sad. And in the stuck phase of the Strive method, we get you to understand why that happens. Why is it so beautiful and amazing and mesmerizing and at the same time so terrifying and sad? And I hope through the allegory of Harry the Hummingbird that you know why and that it only took us two million years to figure it out. So I've got a next step for you. Have you ever felt compelled to leave your charm to explore other aspects of life but fear of lonely and disconnection prevented you from exploring. All right, share it with us. And if you want to make 1000 Days Sober your new charm, then get to www.1000daysober.com and sign up for a choose yourself conversation with moi. And I'll have a talk about whether or not we can help you out learning to step into your power, figuring out who you are, beat addictions if you need to, get a better relationship with yourself and other people if you need to, or just discover who you really are, okay? Choose yourself call, go do it, www.1000daysober.com. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.